بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمده واصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد today i want to talk about i'll first start off by mentioning this that when the last time that someone hired an imam and in the job description of hiring the imam was you will speak the truth you will speak the truth against the people in this community that are doing haram you will speak the truth against the forces of evil when was the last time that the job description of the imam was to look out for the wolves to protect the sheep when was the last time that someone hired an imam where his job description was what that he will stand up for the truth no matter what which community especially here in the u.s has ever supported an imam that speaks the truth as he sees it that has a backbone we're headed into a situation where in the future, the people that, and the Imams, and the Ulama, and Du'at, and Da'is, that are the people who will speak the truth, they will, their jobs will be lost because it will not be in their job description. It'll fade away completely, even what is there will fade away. What to speak of speaking about how the Ummah is being harmed, what to speak about talking about the Khilafah, or what to speak about talking against the status quo, or talking against the kings or the uh, people in charge of the status quo. And so, what will happen as a result? Who will get hired? Uh, the ulama as salatin will get hired. The ulama who sold themselves out to the salatin will get hired. And they will be the ones that will then be put upon the people and they will teach the people and they will teach people the wrong Islam. And these will be an ulama that will have an extreme tolerance for the profane. They will have extreme tolerance for LGBT and whatnot, everything else. They'll tell you, you cannot say a word like this Imam did said in this conference. You can't say a word against the Salatin. You cannot say a word against the people that are your leaders. What nonsense is this? Which Islam did this man study? I don't know what Islam this man studied. But what happened in the past brought down the Khilafah. Who brought down the Khilafah? The people that the Prophet described. Khufra'ul Ura. There will be shepherds with bare feet and desperate. And they will build tall buildings. They will come from a space, a space of rags to riches, of having nothing to having everything. And now they have uh, decorated their buildings, their tall buildings around Mecca, just as like once there were idols around Mecca. How did this happen? And what role did the ulama play in making this happen? A movement started in Arabia with these very people that the Prophet described, that they will be Bedouins, they will be naked, they will be shepherds, and they will be building tall buildings. These people were gathered against the Khulafa of that time, the, the, the Ottoman Khalifa, the Ottoman Empire. And these people waged a war against, for I think almost four years almost, they waged a war on Medina against the Ottomans. You know this? They waged a war against Mecca, a place that you're not allowed to do bloodshed. They waged a war against the, the Khalifa of the Ummah. They waged a war against Islam. And they branded them as, themselves as we are the authentic Islam. They came out with an Islam that was never seen by human beings before. 
but it was wrapped up. You know, falsehood is always wrapped up in something true. So they took some true things, wrapped themselves around it, and then went against the whole of the Ummah, brought down, fought against Muslims in Palestine, fought against Muslims in Yemen, established the Saudi regime in Arabia, and then had a church-state relationship like the Pope and the King used to have in the Christian world. And now they're teaching the people and their puppets are teaching the people that you cannot speak against the king. You cannot incite people to bring the Khilafah back. You cannot tell people what is right and what is wrong and how dare you speak against the leaders. Now, we know what happened in the past. This movement was brought to bring down the Khilafah and bring down the entire Muslim Ummah and its power. And just as that part of the Ummah, they had a certain quality that is opposite to what Allah mentions, Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Rasulullah walladhina ma'ahu, and those that are with the messenger, they're very hard and stern with the disbelief, those who deny the truth. And they have mercy amongst each other. They have rahmah with one another. With Muslims, they have rahmah. And so this group was a group who licked the boots of the kuffar and did takfir on the Muslims. You're a kafir, you're a bid'i, you do bid'a, you're this and you're, you're Sufi that and you're Sufi that and you're and all types, labeling everyone in the Muslim world and saying we follow the first three generations. Yet, in fact, they deny the free three generations when they don't accept the fatawas of the first three generations. Now, they don't accept the fatawas of Imam Malik, they don't accept the, who was in Medina. The inheritance of knowledge of Medina was Imam Malik. But they think they're following Quran and Sunnah. They don't follow the first three generations. They don't follow the ulama of Kufa. They don't follow Abu Hanifa. They think that they have all the brains. Anyway, that's pointless discussion right now. But they were used to bring down the Khilafah and hurt the Ummah. And then while, what? while they were kissing the boots of the British Empire. This is a fact. This is a fact. This is a historical fact that can be confirmed from Muslims, from non-Muslims, from everyone, from people within Arabia. All, this is just a fact. There's no denying that a certain group of Muslims fought against the Ottoman Empire at a time where the Ottoman Empire was fighting on more than 20 different fronts already. They killed Muslims in Palestine. They killed Muslims in Mecca. They killed the Hujjaj. They laid siege on Medina for three years. More than that. So, that was to bring down the Khilafah and bring down the Ummah and bring down the authority of the Ummah and bring down the autonomy of the Ummah. And in their boot lick licking, they continued with the oil and whatever negotiations they have regarding the oil in the world and so on and so forth. But now, a new group is rising from the very same place. A new group that is associating itself with this very place is now saying, don't even say a word against the leader. So when you will not, not hire people who are paid to speak the truth, when you will not hire, and, and you know, it's just like the, 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 the stupidity of what they say, the stupidity of what this imam said. He said, oh, you can speak against what they did, but don't take their name. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference? And then you'll have a problem with that too. Don't take, don't take the name of the king, but just mention what he did wrong. What's the difference? Do you think that he's stupid? Like he won't figure out, oh, I guess they weren't talking about me. Or maybe they were talking about me, but they didn't take my name. You think he's stupid? Like, are, are you stupid? Like, I just don't get this. Okay, so anyway. So, you know, this famous imam makes these ridiculous, hilarious statements that I don't know if I should laugh at or if I should cry about. But this is the future. 
that the truth speakers will not be hired. And, and the bootlickers will be hired. And, and, and then no one will have a backbone. And just as the first wave of this brought down the Khilafah of the Muslims, now in this, you can say, third wave, kind of, or the fourth wave, but in this new phase, they'll say, Hush! Don't speak against the leaders or else. And we don't want anyone amongst us who speaks the truth. Don't rock the boat. And this will now usher in that new world where no one was able to stand up and stop it and warn the people. Because they did the first time, even though we don't know our history, but the first time the ulama of Darul Alum, Dar, Dar, uh, Dar, Darul Deoband, Sheikh Mahmud Al Hassan fought against the British. He had the, the handkerchief movement against the British. The Khilafah movement was there. Muslims fought against the British and Muslims, there were people in the Muslim Ummah that were willing to speak the truth. But now that will be done away with. As this new system, this new system. So we start with the, the Saudi Wahhabi state and now with the Abrahamic Accords being led partly by this scholar uh, Sheikh Isa, who gave the Hajj khutbah this year, who is a bootlicker to the Zionists. Right? And so they're saying, don't say anything against what the king is doing. Don't say anything again. Don't take his name. Don't warn the people against what's happening. Don't talk about Khilafah. These are the people that, these will be the Muslim scholars who will follow the Dajjal. And these will not be the Muslim scholars who will be on the side of Isa alayhi Because to be on the side of Isa alayhi you have to have a backbone. You have to have courage. You got to be a lion. You got to be a real man. And you can't be a sellout. Don't these people realize that all these events are, that are going to happen in Arabia are going to be happening soon? They don't realize that. They think that you know, they don't, because they, they think Saudi Arabia is the beacon of light to the world. And why is it that they bring up this issue, don't speak against the leaders, only when it comes to Saudi Arabia? They don't say this for any other Muslim country. And so, the first wave of this Saudi Wahhabi movement brought down the Khilafah. And now this, this movement that is now starting, that's telling you, shut up. Don't say a word against the haram that they do. That movement is now going to pave the way for these Abrahamic Accords and again backstab the Palestinians. And one thing I want to say, one brother, you know, this famous imam who was making, oh brother, you don't know what happened in Yemen. And then another one would say, oh, you don't know what happened in Egypt. You know, it reminds me of the ayat in Quran where, you know, it's like the munafiqeen who wanted to stay in Medina and not fight and not go to the, 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 the battle. Oh, we'll die if we do this. Oh, don't you know how many people lost their lives and how, what fitna came? Yeah, the fitna that's coming is bigger than the fitna that you think you're stopping. When you have 25% of the Muslims leaving Islam in the West and you're talking about don't speak against the king. Like your fiqh awliyat, your fiqh priorities is completely messed up. And then your harshness towards Muslim brothers and the way you treat them and the way you try to label them and you think you're doing a good deed. Muslims fighting against Muslims, having a Muslims fighting against each other, that's Islamic work? That's Islamic activism? You have su'azan with every Muslim group except for yourself? You think this is, you're going to do Islamic work? Read the chapters on backbiting. Read the chapters on backbiting and know the difference between, read Imam Ghazali's works on backbiting and know the difference between what is really Amr bil Maruf, Nahyan and Munkar and what is when you're slandering someone and backbiting them and when you're backbiting half the Ummah because you relegate their scholars to, oh, they don't know, they don't know anything. You have to sit down and think to yourself that, okay, maybe there is something wrong with what I've been doing. One of the imams there who is very well respected, one of the Salafi imams 
in this conference, who's very, very well, Karim Abdul Zaid. I used to speak with him at Iswa in Maryland. We used to speak together at the same masjid. But I have to say I'm very sorry and disappointed in his level of knowledge of the deen and his attitude. is very shameful. Very shameful. And to humiliate a Muslim brother like this is very shameful. You have no respect for the Muslim brother. Today you did it with him, tomorrow you'll force it with somebody else and somebody else, that everyone has to come to you. You're not the custodian of Islam. Anyway, I will end here. I think this is enough for now. But this is what's happening. People of truth will not be hired. Bootlickers will be hired. Who will tell you, don't say a word against the Salatin. And they think that I already addressed the issue if it's, and I, I think, you know, if you just academically look at the ulama that have stood up against the hukam, the ulama, the number, all the great ulama stood up against the, the viziers and the salatin of their time. Every single one of them, including Ibn Taymiyyah. And the biggest person to do kharuj, I want. These brothers, these Salafi brothers, this brother that was in this conference, I don't want to take his name again. These brothers, this, uh, ask them, who did bigger, who did bigger khuruj than the, uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab? He did khuruj against the Ottoman Empire, who's the very foundation of your movement. This is a fact. And then, uh, you know, I heard some Saudi scholar trying to say, oh, but he wasn't really under the Ottoman because he was a Bedouin and he was in Nudj. The Nudj wasn't really, oh, really? But he, didn't he fight against Mecca and Medina? That was under the Ottomans. You have changed, wallahi, Islam has changed its face. But that Islam gharib and Sayyidu gharib, Islam started as something strange and it's become something strange. People have this view of Islam in their minds. That's a brainwashed view. And you know why it happens? I'll tell you why it happens. It happens because you don't make Quran your Imam. You, you, you don't actually study the Quran. Because if you study the Quran, anyone who ever studies the Quran will never have a problem going against the status quo because the whole Quran's against the status quo. Every prophet came against the status quo. Every aspect of the seerah mentioned in Quran is about the Prophet going against the status quo. So I end here.